and uh, particularly in uh, health culture and in the uh, sorry but what did you say me antwari kalturi wa bari hazari jari yeah so in the in the in the health and and culture and in the normal daily life of the uh, halabja citizens bari tandrusti ema chandin zamari kimiyai mani ta ko esh pewisan bashara sara in health we have a lot of injured people that are still suffering from the injuries that uh, occurred because of the attack and they need a uh, treatment for that بواري كلتوري لشاري هلبجا لتشلكاني سدي رابردوا مسلماني تيابوا جولكي تيابوا مسيحي تيابوا كاكي ان 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 ذا لاست سنتشري اف وي توك اباوت كالتشر ان ذا لاست سنتشري هلبجا واز كومباينت اوف ان ديفرنت سيتيز ديفرنت ريليجنز مسلمز جوز كريستيانز كاكيز كامان ببيت تجي وقت توليرانس بيك وجياو who lived together in a in a top tolerance and they did not they did never never had any violence against each other but that how boy goran kari was a siyasi wa esta bas musulman ka kayhan unfortunately because of the change of the political situation there's only kakis and muslims in the city ja boy au kultura pia ka wajian u tolerance u yaktidi qabul yaktidi qabul kana ka zindu kayna wa so in order to to revive uh, the culture of the coexistence and accepting each other in that city the reculturio pisiman ba anistotu chandin khuliu ka bablin dawratu chandin koru kobno hel na shari alabja so in the, in that case and in order to to restore that culture we need a lot of support from the international community and uh, especially in providing training courses in providing seminars in providing all the other uh, types of the culture support to the city do do abuar do akhad khsel asal kam kapte le dakhek halab ja shar azur hawna man khawani dashti chi gawre kapin de utte dashti shar azur si hamin dashta ba pt le sar ruizawi the last bit i i want to mention is that halab ja shar azur and hawra man which is called the Sharazur plain is the third uh, most important fertile land on the earth ko dawlati britaniya gawra atwane la buari gashano yukshukalo bjeu aburi kshukala haukari halab jo paris galab jo ka great britain also can, can help us and can support us in agriculture uh, field Uh, in order to to develop that field and 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 as i said the, the land is ready but we need the support in order to 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 restart the agriculture this photo is 104 years ago in halabja so So the picture includes the uh, the British uh, ruler of Iraq uh, uh, J uh, Jameson uh, son son Majorson sorry son Majorson his wife and the lady Adila He was there in Britain amro but chawi doing the city halab jabkatu la man libkatawa We hope that Britain would look at Halabja within the same eyes within the same ideas of yesterday Zor spas bo hamutan sarkotub. Thank you very much and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, Governor Azad for giving us uh, this picture from uh, Halabja with this sharp uh, overview on the inspiring vision in uh, promoting progress and prosperity for the uh, deserved people of uh, Halabja. Um, the next speaker uh, with us today is Lord uh, Austin of Dudley. He is a non-affiliated life peer who has sat under this role in, uh, in the Lord since September 2020. He is a close friend of Kurdistan region of Iraq and the people of Kurdistan and joined a parliamentary delegation to uh, Kurdistan region on several occasions. Please welcome Lord Austin.
You're sorry, muted. Sorry, my lord. Can you unmute yourself? That's a schoolboy error. Uh, apologies. <laughs> um, I, I was saying thank you, Carwin, and I want to start by by saying, Your Excellencies, Governor, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank His Excellency Carwin Jamal Tahir, the High Representative to the UK, not just for inviting me to speak today, but for everything he does to represent the interests of the Kurdish people here in here in uh, here in the UK. I want to recognise Right Honourable Rob Halfon MP, the chairman of our group, a great campaigner for education in the UK, for human rights abroad. And it's great to see here the former chair of our group, Jack Lepresti, who did such important work on this issue. And it's great as well to see Alistair Burt here today, a real expert on the Middle East, someone who devoted his entire time in politics uh, to the region. In particular, I want to thank Gary Kent, a great man, a really inspirational figure, who's devoted his life to the causes of human rights, self-determination, peace and reconciliation. And I was so fortunate to visit Kurdistan with Gary and Carwan, and I'm so grateful for everything I saw and learned and everything they taught me about this region. I just want to say this, Gary is the very best campaigner you could wish to have on your side. Now, March is the month of memories for many Kurds, some very good, some very bad. On the positive side, the 5th of March marks the historic and brave uprising in 1991 against Saddam Hussein. And on the 21st of March, Kurdish New Year. But the 16th of March marks the worst for the Kurds. The disgusting decision by Saddam Hussein and Chemical Ali to bombard the town of Halabja with chemical weapons such as mustard gas and sarin. 5,000 men, women and children were killed, some instantly, others in great pain, while 10,000 were injured, as we've heard from the governor, some very profoundly, and for life. It was part of a wider genocide called Anfal, the spoils of war, in which thousands of villages were bombed with chemical weapons or razed to the ground, and nearly 200,000 people were murdered. My visit to Kurdistan had a huge effect uh, on me. I was deeply affected my visit to the Red House in Slomani, which was once a Ba'athist detention centre where thousands were tortured and executed in a prison designed by the East German Stasi. It was liberated in the 1991 uprising, now houses museums on the Alpha Anfal genocide, the uprising against Saddam, the genocide against the, Yaz the Yazidis and the history of the Peshmerga. Visiting that site is a profound experience, something you'll never forget. It is a site of brutal, horrible torture and murder. History doesn't stay in the past. Mass graves are still being discovered. Some years back, a delegation from Parliament stood with the Minister for Anfal and Martyrs Affairs as his staff gently unearthed the remains of a teacher executed during the uprising in the middle of her bill as his son looked on. Imagine that. These atrocities and crimes remain real in the lives of so many saddened and traumatized relatives and the destruction of so much of the enormous potential in agriculture and tourism in the wonderful Kurdistani countryside as the perpetrators of the Anfal genocide forcibly shifted so many people to the cities. This continues today to help unbalance Kurdistan's economic development. Those of us who mark genocides always say never again and part of that is remembering the truth about what happened. It was before my time in supporting the APPG which I'm now co-chair of. In late February 2013, near enough in March, APPG secured a debate on the Anfal and Halabja. They succeeded in persuading the House of Commons to formally recognize the Anfal genocide on its 25th anniversary. Some people asked if it was wise to look backwards, but within months, chemical weapons were being used again in Syria. The following year, Daesh took Mosul and began its genocide against the Yazidis. So much for saying, never again. The trouble is that the chauvinist virus of racism towards the Kurds remains live in Iraq. Hardline Shia militias truly despise the Kurds and want to use them as scapegoats for the failures to improve the lives of ordinary people in Arab Iraq and may seek to undermine the rights of the Kurdistan region that are enshrined in the constitution. The past is not over. 
The present is being made in its shadow and the future demands that friends of the Kurdistan region pay their respects as part of our continuing solidarity with a place that has so much to offer the Middle East and the wider world. Thank you, Carwan. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Your Excellencies, and you, Mr. Governor. Let's use this great event today, dedicate ourselves to do everything we can to support the people of Kurdistan in their fight for justice and self-determination. Thank you so much for inviting me to take part. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, my Lord. Um, you have been a great friend of Kurdistan region throughout your uh, parliamentary career. And I'm sure likewise, you do the same in the House of Lord. Uh, it gives me a great privilege to um, an honor to introduce the Iraqi ambassador to the United Kingdom, His Excellency Muhammad Jafar al Sadr. He has a degree in law and, uh, uh, and master in sociology. Prior to his post, he was head of the International Organization Conference Department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and advisor to the President of Iraq. And he also has served as a member of the Iraqi parliament. We are very pleased that you made your time and to be with us today. Your Excellency, thank you for attending and please welcome. Sad al Hadur, Tahiya Tayyiba. Ismahuli, Ibtidaan, and Rahib Bijami, I say that was Sad al Hadur, when I took them and Bishukur, Ila Mumatiliet, a clean Kurdistan al Iraq. لتنظيم هذا الاجتماع استحضر جميعا الذكرى الأليمة لواحدة من أكثر جرائم العصف الحديث وحشية وهي جريمة استخدام الأسلحة الكيميائية ضد سكان حلبشة وجريمة الأنفال ومقابرها الجماعية التي ارتكبها نظام صدام البائد والتي أحرص شخصيا على المشاركة في هذه المناسبة لما أشعر به من احترام وتقدير لإخوان الكرد وتعاطفي معهم وما مروا به من آلام ومآس واضطهاد وتنكيل ولعلي أشارطهم المأساة نفسها على المستوى الشخصي Distinguished guests, firstly I welcome all the ladies and gentlemen in attendance this morning and express my gratitude to the representation of the Kurdistan region for organizing this meeting as we commemorate the sorrowful memory of one of the most brutal crimes of the modern area, era, that in which chemical weapons were used against the citizens of Halabcha, the crime of An Anfal and its mass graves committed by the oppressive regime of Saddam. I am personally keen on participating in this occasion because of the respect and appreciation I bear for my Kurdish brothers and my sympathy with them for what they have endured from pain, tragedies, persecution, and abuse, of which I share with them on a personal level. In this time, in the year 1988, the dictatorial regime of the Kurds was a crime of our brothers in the use of chemical weapons, the legal weapons, and the legal weapons, which has been more than 5,000 people. مواطن بريء شهيد وأعزل من النساء والأطفال والشيوخ هذه الجريمة التي حزت وجدان وضمير الشعب العراقي والعالم أجمع ولم يكتف النظام المجرم بذلك بل استمر في إبادة أبناء شعبنا الأعزل في جريمة الأنفال البشعة بمراحلها الثمانية التي ارتكبت في المدن والقرى الكردية Around this time in 1988, the defunct dictatorial regime committed a heinous crime against our Kurdish brothers by targeting them with internationally banned chemical weapons, which resulted in the murder of more than 5,000 innocent and defenseless citizens, including women, children, and elders. A crime that deeply affected the conscience of the Iraqi people and the entire world. The, chemical, the criminal regime continued to exterminate defenseless people in the atrocious crime of Anfal in its eight stages, which was committed in Kurdish cities and villages. وبينما ننعم بفرصة بناء تجربتنا الديمقراطية يجب أن نحفظ لشهداء وضحايا الطغيان والدكتاتورية 
دورهم العظيم في مقارعة الظلم والجريمة ولعل الوفاء لهذه التضحيات هو ترسيخ بناءنا الديمقراطي الاتحادي وبما لا يسمح بعودة أي شكل من أشكال الدكتاتورية والاستبداد وقد ثبتنا في ديباجة دستورنا وفاء لمعاناة لمعاناة وتضحيات جميع أبناء الشعب العراقي لتبقى شاخصة أمام الأجيال القادمة While we are blessed with the opportunity to build our democratic experience, we must acknowledge the great role of the martyrs and victims of tyranny and dictatorship in fighting injustice and crime. Perhaps the fulfillment of these sacrifices is the consolidation of our democratic and federal structure in a way that leaves no chance for the return of any form of dictatorship or tyranny. We have affirmed in the preamble of our constitution our loyalty to the suffering and sacrifices of all the Iraqi people so that they remain rem remembered into future generations. وقد حرصنا على الانتصار لضحايا الانثال وحلبجه بان قدمنا المجرمين الذين ارتكبوا هذه الفظائع الى المحاكمه العادله وقد وصفت المحكمه الجنائيه العراقيه العليا هذه الجرائم ضد بكونها ضد الإنسانية وجرائم إبادة جماعية. We were always keen to achieve justice for the victims of Anfal and Halabcha by bringing the criminals who committed these atrocities to a fair trial. The Iraqi High Criminal Court described these crimes as crimes against humanity and genocide. السادة الحضور لم يكن الكرد وحدهم ضحايا مجازر دموية ارتكبها النظام السابق. فقد عانى الشعب العراقي بجميع طوائفه وقومياته من بطش ووحشية النظام البائد وقد مهدت هذه المعاناة والتضحيات الجسيمة الطريق أمام بناء العراق الجديد الديمقراطي الاتحادي المتعدد وإن استذكارنا اليوم لهذه الجريمة يزيدنا إصرارا على التمسك بالخيار الديمقراطي الاتحادي الحر Distinguished guests the Kurds were not the only victims of the blood, bloody massacres committed by the previous regime. The Iraqi people in all, in all their sects and ethnicities suffered from the brutality and inhumaneness of the previous criminal regime. All these sufferings and physical sacrifices paved way for the building of a new democratic pluralistic Iraq. Recalling this crime today only reasserts our de determination to adhere to the free and federal democratic option which we have adopted. وبينما نستذكر أحداثا أليمة وجرائم بشعة ضد إخواننا في حلبجة ننظر اليوم بفخر واعتزاز لما حققوه في مدينتهم وما تشهده من إعمار وتقدم وتطور. ونفخر بتمسك أهلها الكرام بعراق اتحادي موحد وهو بحد ذاته انتصار لجروحهم ودليل على أن العراقيين شعب حي يتحدى الصعاب وقادر على تجاوز الظروف وأنه باق رغما عن الاستبداد والدكتاتورية وأشكر لكم جميعا حسن الإصغاء as we recall the traumatic events and heinous crimes against our brothers in Halabcha, we look at them today with pride in what they have accomplished in their city from progress and development. And we are proud of its honorable people's adherence to a federal and unified Iraq. This is in itself a victory for their wounds and evidence that the Iraqis are a determined nation of people who defy difficulties and are able to transcend through the most difficult of circumstances and that they will continue to fight for life and for living despite the dictatorial tyranny. I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency uh, Ambassador. You've been a true representative of all uh, component of Iraq here in London, and we uh, really value your uh, input and your participation with us today. Um, uh, next speaker, I would like to uh, introduce uh, another good friend, Jack Kloperstey, MP. Uh, uh, he is a former chairman of all party parliamentary group on Kurdistan uh, region of uh, Iraq. He is a co-chair of the group. Uh, please, uh, Jack, welcome. Thank you, Cowan, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me today to make a, a small contribution to this event. Um, I'd like to echo my colleague and my good friend Ian Austin's tributes and thanks to everyone. 
I don't need to repeat them all, but just to pay particular tribute to you, Carwin, and Gary Kent for everything you do to raise the profile and promote the Kurdistan region of Iraq in the UK. You do an amazing job. So, Halabja was a monstrous act and part of an industrially organized genocide. It is of course right that we honor the victims, but it's vital that we understand that the psychology and thinking that planned mass murder and genocide remains prevalent in many parts of the world. Now, as with genocides elsewhere, the process starts, starts with suspicion, contempt, superiority complexes, discrimination, second-class citizenship, and leads to mass slaughter often in incremental stages. Now, the genocide of the late 1980s was prefigured by the mass abduction and execution of 8,000 men and boys from the Barzani clan. I'm very pleased, therefore, that since the great liberation in 2003, the Iraqi government has recognized the enormity of the actions committed by the wicked regime of Saddam Hussein. And I'm honored to be on the same platform as the Iraqi ambassador today. But it's also right to pay homage to the long and determined resistance to humanity of the people of the Kurdistan region. I have no doubt their resistance would have continued whatever, but they caught a break too. Napoleon once said he wanted his generals to be lucky. The Kurds were lucky that Saddam Hussein made a huge error of judgment, as important in its, as important in its way as Hitler's decision to invade the Soviet Union and declare war in the United States 80 years ago. Saddam Hussein's misjudgment in defying the will of the international coalition and community in 2003 was his undoing. Now, likewise, the decision to invade Kuwait in 1990 paved the way for increased Kurdistani freedom. The world was horrified and it didn't wobble as Mrs. Thatcher feared and liberated Kuwait in February 1991. The United Kurdish Front saw the opportunity of Saddam's relative weakness to rise up and liberate much of their land, but were forced back by the brutal uh, act of superior fire firepower with Saddam's still existing regime. Millions of Kurds fled to the mountains and neighboring countries. World opinion was shocked. But our then Prime Minister John Major acted swiftly to deliver humanitarian aid and secured an international safe haven and no fly zone. The Kurds returned to lay the foundations of the modern Kurdistan region. This is now an amazing safe haven for religious minorities and displaced people, as well as refugees from Syria. The Kurdistan region we helped save came to our assistance when they whittled down the power of the Daesh death cult, a common, a common enemy whose ambitions included killing our own people on our own streets. I was fortunate enough to with the APPG to see the Peshmerga on the front lines in Kirkuk, where they had held off forces which had initially had better equipment. The Peshmerga, with the support, fought with the support and assistance of UK and US air power, and they defeated militarily Daesh. I am also pleased that the Peshmerga and the Iraqi army came together, historically a major gain given past history and the record of past Iraqi armies, to eject Daesh from Mosul. And remember that this is a group that also carried out a foul genocide against the Yazidis. It was also a great privilege to be taken by the Peshmerga to a suburb of Mosul before it was finally liberated and to meet Iraqi soldiers who had taken the Christian village of Bartella in what, thank goodness, was a mercifully brief fight. So while we remember the victims and martyrs of Halabcha and Amphal, we should pay tribute to a canny and brave people who have absorbed so much pain but have emerged smiling and determined never to be victims and objects of history, but active subjects and masters of their own fate. They deserve our continuing solidarity, friendship and support. And I'm proud to say that I'm a friend of the Kurdish people. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Jack. You've been a great uh, friend of uh, Kurdistan region. Um, now it gives me a great pleasure to uh, introduce um, another participant, and that is Karen Pollack, uh, a British writer, activist, chief executive of the Holocaust Educational Trust. Uh, she was uh, appointed member of the Order of the British Empire in, uh, in the uh, 2012 New Year Honor for service to um, education, especially about the Holocaust and commander of the British Empire Order in the 2020. It is a great 
honor, an opportunity uh, that she is with us uh, today. And I would like to ask Ms. Pollack how likely the international uh, community would recognize the genocide committed against the Kurds and also uh, what are the benefit of establishing an educational and or a, an education entity that would contribute to the process of recognition and also throwing this question to you as well what would be the right mechanism for lobbying for genocide uh, recognition as you know that international recognition is very important for the Kurdish people and the people of Alabja. Please welcome Karen. Well, thank you very much, um, Karwan, um, your excellencies, governor, um, thank you for inviting me to participate today. Um, it is a real honor to be in, you know, commemorating with you all, but also to be part of a distinguished panel. Um, I'll try and answer some of your questions. Um, in my prepared words, but I'm more than happy to continue that conversation beyond this commemoration because anything we can do to support you, we will do. Um, you heard that I'm the chief executive of the Holocaust Educational Trust and our work is to educate about the Holocaust. Um, we work in schools, we train teachers, we provide resources to use in the classroom and we take thousands of young people to visit the site where the atrocities took place. So we take young people to Auschwitz and to Bergen-Belsen. Um, our mission is so that the future generations, uh, many of them become our young ambassadors, remember what happened during the Holocaust and are committed to passing on the truth of the past. We want everyone everywhere to know what happened. And partly in response to your question, Karwan, it's about education and awareness raising. We work with members of parliament, we work with football clubs, we seize opportunities to raise awareness because even though you think people know about this defining episode in history, still today, there are people who are ignorant of the past or who deny what happened. So our work takes place all year round. But why I'm here today is because I understand the importance of preserving history, that people know the truth and they know the devastation caused by the Holocaust. We want people to learn from it. We want learn people to learn about it, but we want people to learn from it. The term genocide was coined as a result of the Holocaust. The international community pledged never again, and yet genocide has taken place since. The Holocaust was unique. It was unique in its um, premeditated plan to wipe out Jews across the world. That was the intention, the calculated and systematic wiping out of entire towns, communities, and villages. It started with words, persecution, segregation, deportation, and it ended with the gas chambers. And when we talk about what happened with the Halabja, that is one of the most shocking things that only 40 years after the gas chambers, here we talk about the use of chemical gas targeting an entire town. People need to know the horrors that befell the Kurds and the long-term impact and the repercussions still felt today, notwithstanding the positive and resilient attitude and strength that the Kurdish people show, as Jack Lepresti just said. One of the greatest privileges of my life is to spend time with survivors of the Holocaust, hearing their testimonies and amplifying their voices. But many think of those who survived genocide or persecution as the lucky ones, and therefore they have everything to live, live for. And that's true, they survived. But what many don't consider is the trauma that stays with them for decades. Holocaust survivors are in their 80s and 90s, but still have nightmares about what they went through the nightmares that started in the 1940s. Adults, in the, as I say, in their 80s and 90s, they speak of the losses they suffered, still with tears in their eyes, still raw as if it happened only yesterday. Lifelong fears do not leave them. And the same can be paid for the survivors of the Halabja, in particular, the long-term effects of their survival. Mm -hmm. Almost 25 years later, the chemical attacks still manifest in health problems today, 
as you rightly said in in your introduction. Survivors remain um, with various health defects, and it means that these are scars for life. We cannot only remember those we lost, but we should also pay tribute to those who still bear the scars. I think when we talk about international recognition and when we talk about education and awareness, I would say that whilst people know of the terror unleashed on the Kurds, perhaps they don't understand the full extent of the horrors. And the only way to raise awareness and commemorate is to hold events like these and share the human stories of those affected by Saddam Hussein's reign of terror. We all need to create this collective memory and national consciousness where we know what happened, remember the victims and support those who survived by hearing what they went through, getting to know the people who went through it, that is how we carry their legacy. The Holocaust proved the depths of man's inhumanity towards man, and the world said never again. But people continue to be persecuted and slaughtered simply because of who they are. So I'm proud to stand here with you as your ally to remember today, tomorrow, and always. We can and we must do more to remember the past and to safeguard our future. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Karen, for your uh, support and solidarity. And I'm sure we will continue in future discussion uh, about this very important uh, matter uh, for us in Kurdistan region. I think uh, it's a good time to bring uh, a witness uh, to this um, uh, webinar, Dr. Usman Ahmed, a witness, artist, and Peshmerga, who documented the event through art and uh, sketching. Uh, after he graduated from university, he joined Peshmerga, not an armed Peshmerga, but rather a Peshmerga with pencil and sketching material. The effect of the tra tragedy had a huge impact on him to dedicate his career to um, um, documenting all events uh, internationally. He has master degree and PhD uh, here in uh, Britain, and he is exhibited in galleries across Europe and Middle East, including Tate Britain uh, and Imperial War Museum. Please welcome um, uh, uh, Dr. Osman, and he has a presentation. I will share the presentation on the screen while he talks. Please welcome. Thank you so much, Karwan, for this uh, very important event. Uh, and I'd like to welcome all the guests, guests and the uh, audience uh, to watching this. Uh, actually, my presentation is uh, mostly, I maybe my drawing will talk, but uh, uh, in the beginning, I want to just uh, talk about the beginning of uh, uh, seeing this uh, witnessing. I graduated 1985 in the Institute of Fine Arts, and uh, they didn't give me qualification. I mean, the government of Iraq didn't give me a qualification because I wasn't part of the uh, Iraqi Basi party. So, uh, and I refused to go to Iran, Iraq, I uh, uh, chose to go to the uh, mountain to join the partisanis and be uh, at the villages uh, were teaching and uh, doing, uh, experiencing art with the uh, children of uh, the villages. In 1987, uh, I tried to go to the Bergalu uh, Sergalu, where the, uh, the media point of the PUK was there to meet with some friend artist over there. I catch up with the chemical in Sergo uh, Bergalu, and I've been affected by uh, losing my sight for two, uh, one months. Uh, when it getting a bit better, I went back to Karadakh area, which is if anyone can know about the geographic area, it is very far away. I stayed there at the uh, uh, quarter one with the fish marga. And uh, over there, I haven't seen my family for so long. I went to 
Bazian between uh, uh, Kirkuk and Slemani uh, to f see my family, to meet them. After a week, I learned that has all the uh, all the roads has been blocked and uh, they kill all the animals and machineries who they can um, to block any people not access to, to to not go to the villages to have access to the people. So I, I decided to go back. I went back to the village by villages, which take me about. Um, two days, every village I saw it destroyed it by air attack or uh, bombardment. I, uh, I saw nothing, just killing and destroying villages and all the fields. So it, this is very uh, dramatic uh, uh, images came to my mind. In the high mountain, we stayed with a few Peshmerga, which is most of the pupils unarmed, but I was with a few Peshmergas, which is uh, not many, I would say about 15. Uh, we saw it in the high mountain, all these people, crowd people, took it away from their villages and taken away, they put in the machinery uh, uh, arm, take it to the south of Iraq. At that time, you had um, an FM. We I was thinking to just find the, any uh, radio stations or any like Monte Carlo, London, Cairo, to talk about us. Uh, anything can happen because the Iraqi army bring all. He was stopped the war, Iraq Iran war. Bring all his armies around that small areas, and there is no Peshmerga over there. They are all unarmed uh, people. So they, I, we, we had nothing about the world. I was just trying to see some shockable things happen to get change. Nothing happened uh, until they destroyed everything. And um, by chance, me and my friends, uh, a few of us, we survived, we can pass away. At that time, I thought if I stay alive, I will keep continue to say these stories to people and try to uh, let people around the world know what happened over there. That is uh, where the unfast. But that during the experience in chemical uh, and being a vi victims of chemical, I mean, I, I saw the villages in uh, Seussin and Karadakh, or just 200 people had been killed by, uh, attacked by chemical. I saw them and I was, you know, um, experienced how traumatically and psychologically affect your life when your body get burned and you cannot see it for a week or two or months and your, all your body getting burned. I live with that, still I live with this. And this is, at that time I couldn't do a lot, but stay with me, I couldn't draw it until I managed to pass the, all the cities and get to Kandil, then go to uh, PK Media at the Bergalo, at the uh, border of Iran, then send me to Saqqa City. Over there, I have a kind of place, can uh, uh, refuge and uh, work. I did work, and I had a lot of I did a lot of work on my memory and on the survivors' memory. My friends are around me. What they saw, what happened. I, at that time, I was documenting everything I had and bring up uh, all the trauma through my line, my color, and uh, try to let people know what happened. I made the exhibition around the uh, Tehrans, uh, other cities in Tehran, such as like uh, Tabriz, and so other cities. Uh, I have done a project about the children of Halabja. I did, uh, uh, children of Halabja, I went to the camp. I draw, I led them to draw their memories, what they have saw. I collect all those things. It came in the good exhibition around the world, in Paris, in London, in uh, Madrid, in, uh, I show them, I will see some of these, but came in the later on in the big book. It came in a hundred years uh, uh, effect of the 
pain of the children. This is the children of uh, the book of the ch children's, which is, it came in this very important book. It just, just came out 2017 in Paris. It's very important about 100 years effect of the war on children around the world. I managed to include the Halabjic pain in this book. And Professor Ziran, which is Ziran, she sent me to be part of this. So, uh, the, uh, sorry, the things is going on. I've been keen, uh, keep continue working on that. That this poster is just passed. It's the exhibition in Paris, which is Francois Mitra and uh, Mamjelal was opened at that time, uh, 1991. And uh, I mean, at that time, as a young artist, I was always try to be famous to be in showing my works in the uh, very good galleries, good museums, to have a recognition of that. <clears throat> but I never thought that I will be in Tate Gallery or my drawing will be in the uh, William Turner room or in uh, Imperial War Museum, a surgeon's uh, room, which is I really proud to bring the pain of my pupil in that room, especially where my uh, painting showed at the Imperial War Museum, the governor of the museum, Roger, told me that Osman drawing came in this room by the, the pain of the line. It came with the line. So uh, sorry, oh. it's too many images. It came together, but I think I try to pass the, as much as I can with my experience and all of those art, uh, which is artistically, I am doing this as a physiotropical for myself and uh, uh, give back to the pay, the pupils of Halabcha and uh, Anfal. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Asman, for your contribution and documenting uh, the atrocity. Uh, I have to uh, move on to our next uh, uh, honorable speaker, the right honorable Alistair Bert, a good friend of Kurdistan region. Uh, he visited Kurdistan uh, with different hats on as an MP and as a minister on several uh, occasions. Uh, to Kurdistan region. Uh, he's now a global partner governance um, uh, associate and uh, former uh, minister, um, uh, Middle East minister at uh, FCO Foreign and Commonwealth uh, Office and now Foreign, and Com uh, Foreign Commonwealth Development Office now. Uh, Your Excellency, um, uh, His Excellency, uh, he has an excellent insight and knowledge about the region and the United Kingdom foreign, foreign policy towards the events and Middle East and the area. Please, uh, your right honorable uh, Alisabir, please welcome. Um, your Excellency, dear friend Kawan and Excellencies and uh, many colleagues uh, on the call, thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, and for such excellent presentations that we've already heard. Uh, and I would concur with every word of my colleagues and we have been uh, uh, exceptionally moved by the drawings uh, of uh, Osman. Um, in a world grown weary of atrocity, Halabja and the Amphal campaign still stand out as landmarks of indecency, the indiscriminate killing of men, women and children for no crime, but for being in one place at one time and for being the people they were, the Kurdish people. The further appalling truth that we remember today is that the 5,000 lost in Halabja were perhaps only a fraction of the up to 180,000 lives lost in the brutal campaign against the Kurdish people conducted by Saddam Hussein and his regime. Stories emerge regularly of the damage done through these actions of families still trying to find each other, having been separated in barbaric circumstances, or learn just what happened to those who were lost. As uh, His Excellency uh, kindly mentioned, uh, I've been a regular visitor to all parts of Iraq, and it's good to see the ambassador here today as well, and to the Kurdish region for many years as minister and backbencher, and the pain of past events has left deep impression upon me, as I tried to convey both in the House of Commons and beyond. In 2013, I became the United Kingdom's commissioner for the International Commission for Missing Persons, 
an international organization established by treaty and based in The Hague, but which has also worked from Erbil since 2010. I'm proud of their work, which I've seen at first hand, which is to support efforts for justice and closure for families through their forensic skills and abilities to identify the lost and the missing from whatever circumstances, including the harrowing work connected with the Amphal campaign. I work with the ICMP because the victims we mourn today and their families and all those who suffered in the wider nightmare deserve not to be forgotten, nor to be just another chapter of unhappy history. Their lives deserve more, not only for the justice sought for crimes committed, but as a determined signpost for the future, the perpetrators should never be able to sleep easily. Those who've organised today, whether here in London or throughout the world, are ensuring that even if personal memories one day are gone, the story of events and people affected will never be erased. It's a terrible truth that such remembrances remain necessary today. A definition of genocide, which does not recognise the events at Halabja as an element of such a crime, is, in my view, deficient in the eyes of many. There will be no end to the remembrance of such things. Thank you for allowing me to join you this morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Your Excellency, uh, uh, Minister uh, uh, Alastair. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome our next speaker, uh, Gwyn Robert. He has uh, 30 years of experience uh, and he has collected thousands of stories from witnesses. Uh, we would like to hear from him how he felt when he was uh, interviewing all those witnesses uh, directly. Please welcome uh, Gwyn, our good friend. Thank you, Cowan, for inviting me to join you. Uh, may I just say that Osman's pictures, which I saw quite some time ago, I think are absolutely fabulous, really, really good. Now, although the memory of what actually happened in Halabja in 1988 may be fading in some minds, uh, I'm reminded of the American Nobel Prize laureate, William Faulkner, who wrote, the past is never dead. It's not even past. What happened in Halaji was devastating and continues to cast a very dark shadow over the Kurdish regions of the Middle East and beyond, even 33 years after the horrendous attack. I've been there many times, but my first visit uh, in March 1991 was the most mem memorable. Uh, it occurred just days after Operation Desert Storm had come to an end. Halabja then was a desolate city. Buildings were in ruin, Kurds were living on the streets and cooking their food and open fires. Unexploded shells, some still apparently containing lethal chemicals, could be seen dotted across the landscape. The Kurds I saw there were the first returnees from Iran all wanted an answer to a question which had tormented them ever since their escape in March 80, 1988. And that was, where were their loved ones who disappeared during that dreadful poison gas attack? Men next to me dissolved in tears as they picked through cellars which contained the remains of their family members. These poor souls had sought refuge in their basements, not realizing that as gas is heavier than air, it would seep down into these underground shelters, killing everyone in its path. So, a really moving experience. But surviving the attack on a ledger was no joy. I saw one father caressing his traumatized daughter as she whimpered in his arms. In the three years since the attack, she'd lost her ability to speak and was now solely dependent on her loving family. The traumas and tragedies of Alaja echoed throughout the 1990s. Many townspeople feeling abandoned by the outside world and their fellow Kurds. When I returned to Alaja in 1998, I discovered that many of the survivors of the gas attack had inherited a terrible genetic legacy. The toxic chemicals they'd been exposed to had caused incurable cancers, devastating lung and skin disease, paralysis and deep trauma. There was a residual fear amongst the population that the diseases would be passed on to their children. 
I reported these traumatic events to television viewers around the world. But in subsequent visits, I also filmed more uplifting moments. Some Alabjans who were evacuated by the Iranian military when they were babies have returned in recent years hoping to find surviving relatives. Using DNA techniques provided by local Kurdish medical specialists, some succeeded and have been reunited with their extended family. Overall, however, the story of what happened in Halabja is very grim. You need to remember that although Halabja was one of the worst atrocities of the Saddam Hussein era, what happened there was repeated on many occasions across Kurdistan. Some 200 villages were attacked with poison gas in a merciless campaign we saw the destruction of about four and a half thousand villages. Western and European and Eastern countries remained silent about these horrendous war crimes. Some were embarrassed that their companies had supplied the Iraqi regime with the materials used to make these weapons of mass destruction. In the years that followed, I made it my mission to make the world aware of what the Kurds had been through. In 2008, I and my wife Sadie set up the Kurdistan Memory Program, the KMP, with the goal of documenting the Kurdish story for the world. Since then, the KMP has painstakingly researched modern Kurdish history, and we visited every corner of Kurdistan, recording the testimony of people from every strata of Kurdish society. We created a film record that is unique amongst modern heritage projects. In the process, we employed a team of young Kurds to help us complete this, this task. We have now set ourselves one final but extremely important task, and that is to document and reveal the deep patterns underlying genocidal attack on the Kurds in places such as Alagia. We've gathered evidence from across Iraq's disputed territories. And our conclusion is that Arabization began in Iraq in the mid 1930s, was formalized by the Ba'ath Party in 1963, and then accelerated when they returned to power in 1968. It was a deadly mix of a repressive supremacist ideology and brutal ethnic cleansing programs. 50 years of dehumanization, persecution and displacement came to a boil with the Kurdish genocide in the late 1980s, otherwise known as Anfar. This extermination of rural Kurds saw hundreds of thousands expelled from their villages and up to 180,000 Kurds executed in the process. There's little doubt that Arabization caused the most enduring tragedy to befall the Kurds of Iraq and Syria in the 20th century, and Kurds are still living with the consequences. The process, astonishingly, continues to this day in Iraq's Kirkuk region and in northern Syria, where Turkey has replaced hundreds of thousands of the local Kurdish population with Syrian Arabs. The great lesson of Arabization is that past is present and that these long-term policies of ethnic cleansing and state-sanctioned violence have sown the seeds of genocide over an 80-year period. If they cannot recognize that the present can be seen in the past, the Kurds of Iraq and Syria now run the very real risk of a brutal cycle of their history repeating itself. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Gwyn, for your continuous support to uh, our course. I would like to invi invite uh, Gavriel. Uh, he is with us today. Uh, he's a founder of MM Law, uh, a firm dedicated exclusively to advancing uh, private human rights um, uh, uh, law by uh, representing victims of terrorism, uh, crime against humanity. He is also a member of the American Association uh, uh, Justice and um, uh, and also his, um, uh, his firm represent hundreds of the victim of the chemical attack uh, uh, on the city of Halabja and I would like to uh, welcome him and ask him uh, to update us on the legal process um, uh, of um, uh, um, uh, of the, the matter. And please welcome uh, Gabriel.
you muted, uh, you muted, Gabriel. Can you uh, unmute yourself, please? Sorry. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And it's such an honor to be uh, present with this distinguished panel, uh, many of which are our friends and we've uh, crossed paths in the past on, on this issue. Let me first say that a, a, there's always been a question a, a, within Kurdish society is how is mass murder and destruction officially recognized as the crime of genocide? I mean, what is the process? And while it's true that, that governments and parliaments can pass resolutions um, labeling something as a genocide, uh, ultimately though, adjudication of crimes is done by courts. And uh, therefore it's necessary for courts to, on the basis of facts, come up with such a ruling. It is not at all necessary for an international tribunal to so rule. For example, the prime example is the Holocaust. The most important court determination of the Holocaust was the trial of Adolf Eichmann, who was the engineer who designed the gas chambers and ran the program at Auschwitz. And he was tried in a domestic court, not an international court, in Israel. And after that trial came dozens, perhaps over 100 other trials across the world in domestic courts, trying Nazi leaders for their participation in the crime. And today, of course, the Holocaust is recognized as one of the prime examples of what a genocide is. We represent over 3,000 Shahids who were killed by the chemical weapons attack in Halabja and some of the other villages, the Kurdish villages, and approximately 5,000 of their surviving family members. We take on this representation without a, based only uh, either as a, without a, any cost funded by the clients or by any other part. We funded ourselves from our own law firm um, based on a contingency basis. For over 10 years, we conducted extensive research to document both the harms caused to the victims and more importantly, the documentation of European companies who conspired with the Saddam regime to circumvent European export laws and transferred the technology, designed and built the chemical plants, installed highly specialized equipment to weaponize the chemicals. Without this assistance, the Saddam regime would not have been able to deploy chemical weapons. The defendants in this case are a, three German companies, TUI AG, which today is, is actually a tourism company, but then it was a conglomerate uh, dealing in chemicals and steel and heavy industry and infrastructure called Prusag, same company, different name. Karl Kohl, a German company which uh, deals in the most specialized uh, laboratory equipment and manufacturing, which is necessary for chemical weapons production. And Herberger Baum, a German infrastructure company which built the chemical weapons plants, the roads, the warehouses, in accordance with the highly specialized designs of Karl Kohl. Two French companies, Group Protoc and Diedrich Process Systems, who, could, who assisted in circumventing export laws and transferring to the Saddam regime the chemical precursors necessary for the weapons. A Credit Bank Luxembourg, which is a successor bank, uh, which financed many of the purchases um, for the chemical weapons program. General Mediterranean Holding, which is a company owned by a Nazim Auchi, who is also personally being sued. Nazim Auchi was the principal back man for weapons procurement for Saddam Hussein. Um, Franz van Anrat and a, a Dutch billionaire called Hans Melcher, whose Dutch company continued to supply the chemical precursors after Franz uh, Van Anrat is, is ceased. We've obtained records uh, from the German Ministry of Justice, the US Congress, the French Ministry of Justice, the Anfal Ministry, the Halabja Chemical Vixen Society, courts in Germany, France, Sweden, Texas, and other, other sources. On May 13th, 2018, we filed a lawsuit in the civil court in Halabja against these companies and individuals. The justice system moves very slow. And since last March, the courts have suspended the proceedings which were in process because of the COVID pandemic. Thus far, 
The court has received and admitted into evidence over 3,000 documents um, a, from various sources, which traces the role that each one of these defendants had and their knowing participation. One of the key factors a, has always been a, to overcome the defense of the company saying, well, we thought we were building pesticide plants and not chemical weapons plants. But we've proven in court that a, they continue to increase the production and continue to increase the capacity uh, while it became public notice in 1983 that Saddam was using chemical weapons against Iranian forces. And the United Nations Security Con uh, Secretary General published quarterly reports documenting that, uh, as well as international physicians and so on visited victims, uh, Iranian victims, who were also transported to England and Germany uh, for treatment and absolutely proof. So there's no question that, a, that, that these companies knew that they, were cons that they were part of a conspiracy with the Saddam regime. So the question is, how does this in the end result in justice for the clients? Because that's our job as lawyers. And a, a, there, there's really a two-step process. The first process is to finish the trial in, in Kurdistan. Um, and hopefully a, a, a result in a, um, in a determination by the Kurdish court that these companies participated and conspired with Saddam to commit genocide. There's, unfortunately, there's a, a ambiguity in the Iraqi law. And guess what? The Iraqi law was written during the, the Saddam regime and the Kurdish uh, law has not yet supplemented that law. In 2000. In four or five, five, I believe, a, the Iraqi parliament passed a, a law called Law Number 10, which gave exclusive authority only to the a special court created in Baghdad for trying the, uh, the crimes of the Ba'ath regime. And that court has since disbanded. So uh, under that law, there's a question of whether Kurdish courts even have the power and authority to try these cases. Uh, for genocide committed in Kurdistan against Kurds. The courts have taken the position that, a, that they do have the authority to do that. Um, and that they've taken the position that even though this is a civil claim, which could be barred by a statute of limitations, because we're alleging genocide, there should be no statute of limitations. These two positions, a, I believe are correct, but they're controversial. And they give us a problem in the future because the second step of the process then is to take these judgments that we get and bring lawsuits in Germany, France, and Holland, and probably England to enforce the judgments against the defendants. And under international law, and a, a, these judgments can be enforced against the defendants in these countries. But the, court, the local courts will look to two things. One was, was the trial fair? Did the defendants have given a due process, the notice? And that the answer is for sure, yes. And the second question is, was the Iraqi law, uh, did the Iraqi law permit this type of adjudication? If they don't look at the local law, they look at the Iraqi law. And this is where there's an ambiguity that could come and frustrate this long process and search for justice for the clients. In 2013, we presented a draft law to the KRG parliament um, to enact probably one of the most enlightened laws in the world which, which clarifies that genocide and complicity of genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes, um, a, there is no statute of limitations for civil claims. It's clear under international and all law that for criminal cases, there's no statute of limitations, but no country in the world has, has a law a, a solving the issue of what about claims for compensation. So this law at the moment is pending before the parliament and, they, and our clients have been petitioning the parliament. And so we urge the parliament to finally take a stand and get this law passed so that the second step of this process will be secured and we'll be able to bring judicial precedent, not only in Kurdistan, but in European courts that a crime of genocide was committed against our clients and the Kurdish people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Gavriel. Um, I'm sorry we, exceeding, uh, we exceeded the time, but uh, 
I think uh, we have uh, Alicia uh, Karen with us. Alicia, are, are you there, Alicia? I am indeed. Hello, Your Excellency. Yeah, very welcome. Uh, very welcome. Thank you for being uh, with us today. Uh, uh, Alicia, she is a member uh, of Foreign uh, Affairs Committee and National Security Strategy Joint Committee and co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Kurdistan Region. Uh, uh, very supportive to us and to the Kurdistan cause. Please welcome uh, Alicia. Thank you, Your Excellency, and to all the panelists uh, for the opportunity to join you all today. Halabja and Anfal must not become forgotten atrocities, and there is more to be done and to ensure that the world understands truly what happened and commits to make sure that no further tragedies take place. Because there can be no healing without justice, which has still been stolen from so many. And the grief of loss causes scars every single day, as well as the sadness of experiences and memories that will sadly never be. And all of us can play a role in this, but particularly as parliamentarians, because we can urge our governments to support efforts to locate the missing, to support justice for victims and survivors, but also we can refuse to be silenced and to continue to speak up about the atrocities that committed, because we cannot forget what happened and too many still seek to silence the memories of what did take place, and because there are still lessons to be learned. And since my election, one of the things I've been fighting for is the creating of, creation of a conflict or atrocity prevention department at the Foreign Office to do exactly this, to make sure that we recognise the earlier signs of conflict and atrocities being perpetrated and that we make sure we have a concerted and cohesive effort bringing together those who know how to quickly intervene to limit or ideally prevent such atrocities. But I have to say, I also think it's really important in the UK we celebrate the Kurdish people and enjoy the joy, pride and beauty of the Kurdish people and its nation and make sure that that is known within our country. Because too often atrocities do strip communities of their beauty and of their strength, which is uniquely strong amongst the Kurdish people. And we must make sure that more of the British people therefore know the wonders of Kurdistan and its culture, but also how much we owe to the Kurdish people and the KRG for their support to protect our liberties and the freedoms that we are so lucky to have. I've been very privileged to visit Kurdistan. And the last time it was, it was very surprising to come from the South uh, where I had been in Iraq, uh, working on how we defeat the terrorist Daesh to then be in the green beauty of Kurdistan, listening to uh, watching the Royal Shakespeare Company perform Hamlet. It was truly a sign of the oasis of peace, stability and friendship that Kurdistan represents. But there is still much more to be done and there is much more justice to be delivered. And all of us at this Remembrance event must come together, united in a determination to be a voice for those who others seek to silence because efforts to silence the Kurdish people remain to this day. So I commit today that I will do all I can to raise awareness of the dehumanization, the displacement and the genocide that took place to try and ensure that lessons are learnt, but also to share my love of Kurdistan, its beauty and the warmth of its people, to do all I can to support the Kurdish people and to give a voice to the Kurdish people in my parliament and beyond, because that is the least to which you are entitled. And it would be a great joy to have any opportunity to do exactly that. So thank you for inviting me today. And it's been a privilege to listen to the other panelists speak. Thank you so much, Alicia. Uh, Alicia, thank you for your uh, love compassion and support to Kurdistan region. Thank you so much. Uh, I move on to uh, last but not least, uh, our good friend Gary Kent conclude the uh, webinar. Uh, Gary, he's secretary of all party parliamentary uh, group on Kurdistan region of Iraq. He has been promoting friendship and understanding between the people and representative of the Kurdistan region and the United Kingdom. He worked in parliament for 34 years, uh, although, although he doesn't look that old, but uh, <laughs> that it is. He is a writer and research fellow at Soran University in Kurdistan region of Iraq. Please welcome Gary. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm the sweeper. I'm not going to say much of what's already been said, and I hope to be brief. Uh, first, uh, Rob Halfon, the chair of the APPG Census Apologies. He's chairing the Education Committee today in the Commons. And he wants to say that um, he's proud to be a friend of the Kurds. And the key thing is that they refuse to be imprisoned by their history while making sure 
that that history of genocide and repression is known. Now, some of us have been to Halabja. The thing that moved me most at the entrance to the cemetery, and we paid our tributes at the mass graves there, is a sign, the simple sign that says, no bath allowed, no bath is allowed. And it reminds me very briefly of the words of the evil genius of Anfal and Halabja, uh, Chemical Ali. I won't say what all that he said, some of it's very rude, but he's basically saying, I'll smash their heads, these dogs, I'll bury them with bulldozers, and the international community will do nothing about it. Who will listen to the Kurds? Well, the good thing is that in the end, Chemical Ali was wrong about the international community. And I think that the next thing that we're going to be talking about as an APPG is what John Major did 30 years ago in March, April uh, 1991, uh, with the uprising, millions fleeing into the mountains. And he proved that uh, the Kurds do have more friends than the mountains. And his brave and innovative policy definitely uh, saved the Kurds. Looking to the future, um, I'd like to see the day when Halabja is remembered, uh, the suffering is remembered, but it's also known for something else. And one of its products that many of us like here is, are pomegranates, the healthy food, Hana in Kurdish. Now let Halabja come to be known for Hana, for pomegranates, for health. Let that be the way that uh, we think of Kurdistan. But of course, uh, we have to um, put down a marker. A mark in the past is putting down a marker for the future. I'm so glad that the governor of Halabja was here and so glad that the uh, ambassador uh, of Iraq were here. Because I think that uh, what comes out for me is that very simple stuff. The Kurds matter immensely to Iraq. They matter immensely to the UK and they must matter much more to the world as a whole. As the same code of stand, Barbroin, let's get on with it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Gary. And uh, I would like to thank you all again and um, conclude the webinar by thanking you all for your time uh, that uh, being with us today. And thank you again very much from me and my colleague at the representation of Kurdistan Regional uh, Government. Um, thank you all very much for the significant contribution and valuable support and solidarity shown to the victim of Kurdistan region. Thank you. Thank you so much and goodbye.